Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Got something very interesting for you today, a Sony DME 7000 digital video effects unit. This is a professional uh, quality broadcast uh, editing bit of gear that they use in TV studios all around the world. And this one actually comes from a TV uh, studio here in Sydney, uh, or former one, uh, TV One, that was on the Foxtel uh, cable TV network. They've just uh, shut down in uh, December last year, I believe. So they tossed out all their gear and uh, I scored this effects unit. Oh yeah, I love the smell of uh, niche professional electronics like this. In this case, uh, digital video production equipment. I don't know whether or not they uh, generally do this with PCs and stuff these days, but I think these things are still incredibly popular. This is uh, about 1996 vintage or uh, something like that. That was when it was first released. Um, I don't even know if Sony uh, still sell them. I have no idea. Maybe they still do. But uh, anyway, this is designed for professional TV studios to edit and add effects and fades and wipes and all sorts of effects to uh, their video all in real time using one of these custom controller things and take a look at it. I don't, sadly, I don't have that uh, with it. I've only got, this is just the control panel which takes the uh, digital video in, digital or analog, I think, in video in and out of the system and does all this processing for it. And there's no need for a PC. This is all done directly in the hardware in here. All these video effects. So it's gonna be really interesting. We've got eight different boards inside this sucker and well i think we're in for an interesting look let's go and here it is and it really is enormous it's a big uh 19 inch rack mount thing geez can't even got to swing my camera out of the way and we've got all these different plug-in boards in here for all the different effects we're going to have main processor and then different boards for different types of you know linear non-linear effects and you know all sorts of digital stuff they've got discrete hardware dedicated to doing these video effects as i said no pc attached to it whatsoever there is a control panel for the user interface and stuff like that but then the vga screen connects directly to that uh, control panel i believe no pc involved all done in discrete hardware and i love really professional level electronics like this it's going to be designed superbly it's sony okay and we've seen sony uh teardowns before but this is you know another level this is professional level gear spared no expense whatsoever it's not designed for a consumer price point if you have to ask uh, the price for something like a system like this, you can't afford it, don't even bother. Um, but if anyone does know the price, I'd like to know, <laughs> even if they uh, still sell it. This is not a HD uh, unit, it only does uh, SD uh, com component video, which, which is what the TV1 uh, network was. They haven't actually, hadn't actually upgraded to uh, HD yet, but it really is professional level uh video processing and effects and they go to a lot of effort in the hardware to ensure that the image quality remains absolutely perfect and here's the manual for it which i will link in so i won't go into uh, huge detail and also link in the user and uh, configuration manual as well but look you know, it's, <laughs> there's the user interface for it with the trackball and all the custom buttons directly hooked up to the monitor which then this uh, control panel hooks up to the processing unit and it's the processing unit that we've actually got here. This doesn't do any processing itself, it's just sort of like the uh, user interface software and things like that and uh, oh, it does, um, basically it's a multi-effects unit and that's what it does that's what we're going to tear down today and of course it does all sorts of weird and wonderful effects but it promotes heavily the fact that it's um you know it's video quality unprecedented picture quality employs 4222 uh processing that's the chroma subspace uh sampling and things like that which i won't go into uh details on that really it's quite a complex field but and it samples at a 10-bit resolution and then it uh, does all the processing in digital, of course, hence why it's called a digital uh, multi-effects unit. So once it's actually converted that analog signal in digital, can do pretty much anything it likes, and it does it directly in hardware in this thing, which is fantastic. Not a PC, as I said before. And this also can hook up as part of a big system to a digital switching unit, so it can keep the 
uh, all the video signals in digital format and then route them through switches as part of a more complex uh, network of editing and uh, recording gear and also and uh, broadcast gear and all sorts of stuff with inside a typical TV studio and it can do all sorts of weird and wonderful effects glow effects brick effects shadow effects sparkle and all that sort of stuff but it does it really super high quality it does go into uh, how it actually uh, does pixel uh, interpolation and all sorts of stuff like that and uh, does color correction and oh, man there's tons of stuff so you'll get different boards which hopefully we'll see inside here that do and you know it might have a specific board for color correction processing for example and uh, you know that's the whole specs for the thing if you want to read it and we've got a whole bunch of these boards there's eight boards installed in this unit so we'll find out which ones we've got and a whole bunch of specs for those interested um sd as i said it is not hd it is uh, PAL, well, presumably it's uh, PAL SD uh, standard here used by the TV1 network. <laughs> That's why they shut it down. Couldn't be bothered going HD. And for those curious, this box fully populated weighs about 27 kilos and draws just over 400 watts. So there you go. Oh, what a beast. And when you open the thing up, you can see a big power supply uh, slot over here. That'll likely, uh, you know, my guess might be contained a uh, toroidal transformer, a nice uh, low leakage toroidal or something like that. Don't want anything interfering with any analog uh, sampling stuff in here. You want to avoid that as much as uh, possible. Some status uh, LEDs up here. I haven't actually uh, powered the thing up. Uh, I believe it was pulled directly from the rack, so I... Uh, of the understanding that it still fully works you can see the nice um rfi tabs down the bottom here and uh, this cage on the front just unscrews and then we can pull the individual boards out so let's do that i've undone the screws and well hey look at that some more rfi uh finger tabs on there i love those they're just they're, they're spongy like that so they make uh they make good contact as it slides in. Just absolutely brilliant attention to detail on that. You can tell that this is a professional level bit of kit. And let's just slide a typical board out here. Nice little levers as you'd expect. And ta-da, look at that. And we'll take a look at each board in detail, of course. But woohoo, it just goes on and on. It's like the Star Wars, you know, the uh, rolling uh, intro thing. It just goes on and on and on. Look at that, DIN 41612 connectors, the connector of choice for uh, all these sorts of rack instruments. Man, I can't even fit that on the wide angle lens here. Just ridiculous. Woohoo! And that's the back of the unit. Two huge fans over here, plus all your connecting, all ton of BNC uh, stuff, all of your interface stuff for the control panel, of course. Then you've got a, a network interface terminal. You know, none of this uh, Ethernet bullshit and uh, networking, you know, PC stuff and things like that. Although I think I read somewhere that it does have some sort of uh, Ethernet y type interface in it somehow. But these are actually all, um, well, a, a majority of these are all RS422. Uh, serial interfaces, so differential pair serial interfaces. RS-422, of course, very common. It's got some RS-232 on here as well, but 422 is more common as a proper differential uh, pair for long runs in professional applications like this. Let's look at the analogs. And here's all our fantastic looking BNCs. I love these. And these would be the highest quality BNCs, of course. They wouldn't, Sony wouldn't be skipping on these things. By the way, serial number... 50,764, that's a lot more than I expected that they would have made of these things. But hey, I guess there's a lot of TV stations out there. I wonder how many total they actually made. I don't know the manufacture date of this. We'll uh, be able to date it when we actually um, open the thing. But as I said, uh, it dates from around 1996. That's when the model, this model uh, was first introduced. Don't know if it's still for sale or uh, how long it was in the market, but these sort of things have a long lifespan. They really do. And here's your standard analog component inputs over here. And of course, all professional broadcast uh, video is all done as component video. It is not done as a mixed together, you know, S video or composite signal or something like that, because you want the absolute 
utmost highest quality. So they have the component inputs and it is your typical uh, YPBPR system. So we've got our Y uh, input here, which is our Luma signal, and then we've got the two different signals. So it's the blue signal minus the Luma signal and then the red signal minus the Luma signal. And you'll notice there is no green. We don't need green because green can be uh, inferred from the other uh, two signals. And there's a key input uh, here. I'm not exactly sure of the uh, function of that in terms of uh, the professional uh, editing environment for those in the know it's a, some sort of you know maybe some sort of synchronization signal for the system or something like that and I'm not entirely sure but they're our analog inputs and of course these are our component analog outputs after all the video processing so it's a uh, two channel system by the looks of it and I'm not sure about all the combiner inputs and how they actually work as part of the system you can go and read the whole system installation and all that sort of uh, stuff or for those familiar with it please leave it in the comments and of course as I said digital video out as well so after it's converted here they can actually output and switch and process the digital signals directly with other units and send them to video switching units and stuff like that actually it's interesting that the analog outputs have a sync here and also a key so maybe that's like a keyframe or something like that perhaps that I'm actually thinking of and thankfully I do have a list of all the different boards looks like there's some little piggyback boards in there and what they do and as I said looks like we've got almost the full complement there is one missing board I think the nonlinear effects board could be missing here but anyway, look digital sparkle effects white you know, graphics boards combine a lot in effects key channel that key channel is uh, probably that keyframe uh, connector we saw on the back I was talking about advanced shadow effects and then uh, down the bottom looks like we have our digital um, input boards and uh, output boards so they will have the big uh, high quality 10-bit DAC and ADCs on there for converting the videos and input and output and uh, there you go so let's start off with the processor board up the top here and as we saw before it looks like it's all going to be predominantly surface mount and that's what you'd expect from 1990 you know the mid 90s uh, thing looks like oh I got some connectors for some piggyback stuff here but look at that that is our main processor board and it looks like that they're going to be nicely labeled the PCB design has done excellent work here or the system designer done great work and labeled everything separate K KF there we go is that uh, keyframe hardware down here we've got IO stuff and the main processor Ethernet up the top there you can say see it says ether and wow look at that and as I said all DIN 41612 connectors down the side here looks like we've got uh, three of them two are oh here we go sorry about that uh, the, the top and bottom ones are three-way ones and the center one four-way look at that so the center one might be you know power one might be dedicated to power for example and the others dedicated to IO or something like that that'd be my guess anyway but uh, yeah and of course on the back look full shielding on every board there's probably no components on the back so I don't think I'll bother taking the uh, shielding off I might do it on one but sort of had a little peek down in there and I can't down the corner down in there can't really see anything so you know nothing really exciting on the bottom there all the components on the top beautifully laid out look at the layout of these boards I think we'll see that across all of the boards really professional level placement nobody's auto placed these things by the way and I'll probably talk about the PCB layout later once we get a probably a more dense or complex example this one's relatively uh, simple in the scheme of things um, so it's all about component placement anyway I'll go into that later four batteries up here they're pretty serious I presume that they're all uh, <laughs> wired in in parallel are they or I don't know that's weird dedicated uh, controller up the top IDT chip there's a couple of chips I recognize national semiconductor mark let's take a look at the individual bits and of course it is made in Japan beautiful and I do like the front panel multimeter test points look at that they're right you can just plug your probe straight in they've got the two millimeter socket there that will fit your probe precisely you can plug them in in this case five volt test connector brilliant and this one looks like it has a whole bunch of diagnostic leds and mode dip switches i'm not sure what they are you'd have to read the manual and anytime you've got a connector on the front panel and access user accessible 
uh, connector like this, not designed to go out the back of the unit, but designed to be only accessed once you take the front cover off. It's some sort of, you know, diagnostic slash programming, you know, uh, interface like that. Somebody comes along, they want to do something to the rack troubleshoot or maybe configure it in uh, some way or something like that. Then they'd come along, they'd programming box or their diagnostic box or whatever into that thing and, uh, you know, do their business. But it's not designed for normal sister o operation. That's why it's on the front of the board, only accessible when you open the door and not on the back panel. Because once these things are installed in the rack, of course, you can't access the bloody back panel. It's a pain in the ass for the technicians to come along and troubleshoot these things. You don't want that or, or to change the configuration that they might have to do every once in a while or something like that. So, yeah, you mount on the front, nice and convenient. Check this out. This is interesting. This is obviously part of the power input on this DIN 41612 connector here. Got a uh, just an electrolytic uh, cap here, service mount. Look at these two beasts. They've got like a plastic cover on them. These are actually fuses. They're 10 amp, 125 volt fuses, almost as if they've got a ceramic interior covered by a plastic outer thing. So it's almost like they're a little mini uh, HRC high rupture, rupture capacity fuse. I haven't seen that form factor before. Very interesting. And in case you're wondering, 10 amps, oh, that's a huge amount, isn't it? Well, not really, because these are these DIN 41612 connectors, very high current capacity per pin. They've paralleled up at least four pins here for that main input there, probably the uh, main 5-volt input, and you can easily get 10 amps out of those four pins. So it does actually have an Ethernet interface, as I read in the document there. It's a national uh, semiconductor sonic chipset there for Ethernet, but it doesn't have a standard Ethernet connector. So, eh, it must be, uh, you know, doing it some other physical uh, connector, maybe via the uh, control uh, panel or something like that, perhaps. And please forgive it being upside down, all the electrons are going to fall out. But anyway, we have ourselves a date code 9907. Some of the other 74AC series chips around here, sort of you know, late 98 vintage. So it looks like this was uh, manufactured sometime in 1999. So yeah, not that long ago, 14, 15 years old. And what we have here is an IDT RISC processor, 32-bit RISC processor, nothing fancy. Typical of the age of, you know, 1994 kind of vintage uh, processor, 40 MIPS at 50 megahertz. So <laughs> not exactly a screamer and uh, a really interesting choice for Sony to actually uh, do that. But I don't think that's the main processor for all the uh, doing and controlling all of the effects. And why don't I think that? Well, it's simply location of the thing. It's right over here near the connector. It's got no huge memory coupled uh, to it. Lots of other logic around here. So my guess would be that that IDT risk processor is probably controlling or talking to in some way the the control panel, that user control panel that we looked at, something like that. I don't think it's doing much more than that because if you have a look over here, we've got ourselves, we'll have to lift the skirt up on that one and find out what that is, but look at all the memory coupled into that plus the door to board up here probably for expanded memory and stuff like that. So this has got to be doing most of the grunt work over here. This is just miscellaneous interface or some other type stuff. And then near to the RISC processor, we've got a couple of other uh, programmable devices here. Why are they programmable? Well, dead giveaway, they've got labels on them, and they also say uh, CPU as well, EPM 7032, CPU 196. Take that off, see what we have under. And we don't actually have a processor, and the number was a dead giveaway. I knew it was familiar. It's an Altera PLD, EPM 7032, exactly as it said on the label. You know, it's sort of an old-school, low-density PLD. So they've just got some sort of glue logic stuff like that embedded in these things. But obviously not enough glue logic to fit in these. A, they've got multiple devices, but they've also got all this 7.4 AC series stuff around here. And yes, it is AC, um, much higher performance than uh, HC, of course, so that'll be uh, chewing some juice as well, contributing to that 400 watt uh, power consumption. But these days, of course, you'd fit all of that inside one FPGA or something like that. But hey, back in those days, they decided to use no less. Well, three here. There's another couple of uh, devices over here. These look like... Uh, they could even be um, EPROMs, I think. So anyway, but 
a whole bunch of sort of uh, glue control logic could easily have been replaced by one large scale FPGA but hey they made the choice to do it a bit old school maybe even uh, based on an older design system or something like that so they didn't want to reinvent the wheel eh, maybe they already had a lot of schematics for it and they were doing an upgrade from a previous uh, processor design uh, something like that so yeah that's what you end up with and yep, they are exactly as the label said, 27C1004 EEPROM. So they would be for the main processor down here. We'll now take a look at. Ah, well, you read the label and there you go. It's another Altera CPLD, but a bigger beast in this case, the EPM7064. Uh, so I don't even need to lift the label. In fact, you can start seeing the Altera mark there. And don't be confused by the CPU-196, it just occurred to me that's actually the model number of this board here. It's called the CPU-196, so it's not like there's a CPU in there, a CPU soft core or something like that inside this thing. There's not. It's a CPLD that probably couldn't even do a processor soft core inside this thing. You need an FPGA for something like that. So, yeah, they've got some really dedicated logic happening in here with a whole bunch of memory dedicated to it. And each one of those memory chips, SD RAM of course, but pretty huge, of course, 1 megabit or 128K by 8 SRAM for each one of them. And they've got 32 of them on that board, plus uh, looks like a connector for another piggyback memory board as well. So there you go, 32 megabit of SD of SRAM I have you know well only 70 nanosecond SRAM on this thing but obviously doing all that uh, maybe frame storage or something like that and here's this KF section which I've assumed is keyframe but I could be wrong we've got some IDT uh, FIFO possibly FIFO memories or high speed memories here by the looks of an old school gal over here and this is what I was afraid of in this whole teardown is custom Sony stuff and I've been surprised by the sort of lack of it on this processor board actually I suspect we're going to get hit with a lot more Sony custom branded stuff and well I don't even think we'll be able to Google that part number it's got some memory attached to it could be an off-the-shelf uh, processor or uh, you know that's just rebranded with the Sony part number but Sony being so huge they can spin their own silicon so I think we're not going to see the end of this. So unfortunately, in this teardown, we may not be able to get a, a good understanding of what the individual devices are. And my guess that these IDT ones were FIFOs was actually wrong. They're actually uh, IDT7164. They're 64K bit high speed SRAM organized as 8K by 8. Then we've got this I.O. section down here, and this probably does a lot of the RS422 serial communications as I said to various uh, other things and yes we do have some custom Sony branded chips around here we've got uh, four Omron relays here they're sort of you know oddball out of place over there on their own obviously we've got an NEC looks like it could be some sort of NEC little uh, micro there or something we've got a crystal associated with that and these look for all the world like memory going down here there's a few of them and then we have a what looks like a programmable device uh, next to it and yeah these are individual Hitachi processors HD 647 180 little 8-bit uh, micros and they got four of them all down the board looks like coupled with their own memory over here and well what do we got for the interface over here and yep I was bang on RS 232 differential line drivers in this case uh, dual AM 26 LS 30s bingo so these microcontrollers here are handling all of the RS-232 interface. Easy. And it's interesting how they've segmented the design here, but that's what you expect in these big systems engineering things. So, you know, somebody worked on designing this little interface over here, somebody worked on this main processor ar ar architecture, somebody might have worked on this keyframe stuff, and they keep it all modular. Maybe even, uh, you know, they drew this and did the schematics themselves for each section. Somebody merged it all together and things like that. Because this is a huge job designing this sort of system. This is only just one of the boards in here. We've got seven more to go. Oh, goodness. How long is this video going to be? Obviously, one engineer hasn't done this. <laughs> if they did, they had a lot of coffee and pizza boxes, let me tell you. And, of course, there's one thing you may have noticed absent from any of this is any bypass caps.
passive, you know, look, there's nothing on here. What are they relying on the big ground plane in there? No, obviously, we're going to find some bypass caps on the bottom. I've taken the screws off. I haven't had a look yet. But we expect that oh, that's the only thing you'll find on the bottom. And ta-da, it is. Look at that. All of the passives. But it's not just caps. We've got some, uh, looks like, termination resistors up here around this main. That's uh, the main C, P, or D up there. So they're probably doing, you know, a whole bunch of resistors. So they're terminating uh, something. And, of course, there you go. Bypass caps for each individual chip down in there. Too easy. Not much else. They've got some SOT23s for that uh, power stuff with the battery backup and things like that. But... Yeah, nothing too fancy. Once again, some uh, termination resistors down here for just over this unpopulated uh, internal connector, by the way. So that one's got nothing on the other side, but they have populated all of the resistors there anyway. I do find it interesting how on this whole board they've got one dip part, and that's this old school gal over here. So that's almost a dead giveaway that this is based on an earlier design because they already did it nobody wanted to oh you know it's friday afternoon i don't want to have to re-spin this thing and put it inside something else let's just copy it bugger it we'll just bung it in there for the next design she'll be right bob's your uncle no worries and of course as with any professional design attention to detail you don't want any the bottom of the board if it flexes to short out to the metal shielding underneath so proper insulating sheet thumbs up and we are missing that second board in there, what, what I thought was a non-linear effects board, but thankfully they have the part number on here. And no, we do have the non-linear effects board, so let's take a look at that one now. And I, I'm fairly sure that they have to be in a specific order inside the chassis. I don't think it's just like a generic parallel bus at the back and you can just whack them in there willy-nilly. I think they have to be in uh, specific locations, but I could be wrong. I haven't <laughs> read the, you know, 100-page manual in any sort of detail. So look at that. We have our nice piggyback board here, which has an MPU on it. And, uh, oh, look at this. This is, this is interesting. Look at this. This... Wow, this is quite getting quite dense, but look at that. This one's actually not one big board, but it's actually multiple boards there connected with board-to-board -board interface like that. Interesting why they've gone for that, made that system design choice over the one big board we saw before. Mm. Now, I believe the rest of the boards we're going to look at here are completely optional, but hey, you know, that's the entire point of this effects unit, is that you do effects with it. And this is the first one. This is the non-linear effects board. And I'll read the manual. It does non-overlay effects such as wave, ripple, flag, and broken glass effect, and also uh, overlapping effects such as page turning, rolling, cylinders and spheres, and all those wanky things that you saw in, you know, that were very common in sort of 1990s wedding videos and things like that. So that's what uh, this board can do. But it, interesting to note that you also need another board, which we do have in here, which is a combiner slash lighting board. And they say that's required in order to improve the edge quality of the image. So that's rather interesting in that this board can do all the effects processing, but to get better quality in terms of the edges of the image, you need another board. Very interesting. See, this is getting rather annoying. These boards are so big that I can barely fit them in frame here. You can't see much detail. You might have to watch this in HD. But anyway, as I said, two separate boards. Why they've done that, I don't actually know. Um, they've maybe subdivided the tasks again. But the good thing here is that they've actually uh, separated, as before, all the silkscreen stuff. So this is the Z process part of it. Actually, it looks like only two Sony branded chips in there for the Z process. This is the multiply and add. So just <laughs> just doing multiply, multiplication and adding. This is the CPU up, up here. They've got another one of these IDT 32-bit uh, processors up here with the ROMs here. Um, well, ROMs here and another couple of Altera uh, CPLDs. What else have we got? We've got floating point plus integer. Math around here. This section over here is labelled Serial 2 slash 3. 
not exactly uh, sure what that is. We've got ourselves a DSP processor up here, so I'm not sort of not sure what that's actually dedicated to. But uh, obviously they needed a no surprises. Uh, Texas Instruments TMS 320. It was and probably still is the industry standard DSP uh, processor. So anytime you need DSP stuff, you're going to find something like this in anything from sort of you know 1980s vintage through to 2000s vintage. You're still going to find a Texas Instruments. Uh, 320 series DSP in there um, float and uh, divide as well so we've got some more this is MPU um, there well this is an MPU board so we've got floating uh, point and uh, dividing operations we've got H and V output so I'm not sure what uh, H and V is we've got another power device down there and there's uh, Z and the key output as well the keyframe output once again some Sony custom chips in there uh, so that must be dedicated to the output, that key output BNC we saw on the back panel connector. Because here is also some key circuitry over here. So maybe that, I don't know, detects the key frame or synchronizes up or something like that, figures it out. And this one output drives it or, I don't, but it's more, you know, it's not just a driver. We've got some you know, processing happening down here, some serious devices happening. So, yeah, it's rather curious. There's actually... Some sort of weird uh, sort of gunk on this. Let me see if I can get a close up. Check out all this weird stuff. It's not dust. It's actually like I can, you know, there is a bit of dust on there. I can wipe off the dust, but it requires a lot more force to wipe off whatever these white specks are. And I didn't see them on the other boards. The other boards had dust, but they didn't have these white specks all over the place. Mm, interesting. And as I said, this board is full of Sony custom chips here. Whether or not they're just rebadged or there are custom Sony silicon, I don't know. I, I would presume that they're Sony custom silicon because there's a very specific tasks we're doing here for these video effects so wouldn't surprise me if they've uh, rolled their own asics for these sort of jobs or uh, you know mask or something like that for these sort of uh, specific tasks and then for something like the z process section here well look what are these part numbers i don't know we can google them but i doubt you're ever going to find any info on these things and that's all there is just two custom sony chips and of course, you end up with that similar but different part numbers, CXD8838, for example. You Google that and, well, you find some obscure page somewhere that says it's a CMOS I.O. expander. So, I don't know, does that make sense in a Z process section? Oh, not really. And then this custom multiplier and adder with, well, two uh, programmable devices here. What are they? And... What is this Sony custom chip? I don't know. And that one has a couple of 8K by 8 PROMs next to it. So, yeah, they're programmed with the firmware to do the multiplying and adding inside this. But what is it? Some form of processor? Well, it's got to be. It's got some sort of PROM. So, or it could be a state machine uh, type thing, something like that, executing code in the PROM. But what it is, I guess we'll never know. And likewise for all these other Sony uh, chips as well. We've got three identical ones here. Who knows what they do? Another one which looks the same, but it's not. It's got a different part number. Another couple down here in a section. So that's the Y processing. Whoa, what do we got? Yeah, we've got the Y processing under the board. I've taken it out. And it's got its own memory associated with that by the looks of it. Or there may not be. May not be. These are Sony branded as well. So, oh, goodness, it's rather frustrating. And yes, they are running that RISC processor at the full 50 megahertz is capable of. Woohoo! 40 MIPS. Awesome. And it looks like we've got a terminal interface here on the front and data interface as well. Once again, a technician or maybe even a user level can come around and plug something into these things and, well, have a fiddle. Now, one idea for why they've split the board here I just came up with is uh, there's also a 3000 series model of this uh, processor unit, which doesn't do nearly as much. So maybe uh, they've decided that, well, for the 7000, it can do some sort of extra effects, which are de and they just want to decouple the design of that, the effects part, from more of the processing part over here. Or maybe they've got lesser options on the board that plugs into the 3000. They didn't want to respin the whole thing. They wanted to reuse all of the more generic processing over here, perhaps. Eh, 
That's my guess. And there's that TIDSP there, copyright 1991, awesome. Um, but of course, it's much uh, older than this. And it's got the emulator connector over here, so you can plug in the uh, diagnostic and uh, development uh, tools over here, so you can work on that sucker. But as I said, what that's actually doing, we've got some glue logic here with the Altera uh, PLD and various other stuff. But yeah, what the DSP is actually DSP in? I don't know. Now we're on to the wipe slash graphics board. I've taken the little uh, daughter board off here. It's got some beefy looking Sony chips on that. Oh, look at that. Jeez, ton of stuff going on there. Anyway, um, this provides wipe pattern related effects such as white crop, uh, wipe cropping. Uh, patterns include vertical, horizontal, slant, all those circular cropping and all that sort of uh, jazz. Color mix generator and additional graphics functions are also included such as X, Y, Z axis, numeric positional data, grid lines, off-screen location marks and the graphics are inserted on the uh, video output for this thing. So you can overlay uh, grids and all sorts of stuff for editing and things like that. Look at this, this is the wiper generator circuitry, a huge amount of circuitry all in here delineated by those white silk screen lines, I love that, it just makes it really nice, the PCB designers, you know, really segregated all this sort of stuff, fantastic, and well look at all that circuitry dedicated to doing wiping effects and stuff like that and it must be sort of fairly generic because it's got all different types of wiping effects but once again Sony 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 so that wiper is all to do the wiping effects but they've also got a processor on here once again the 32-bit ID IDT risk processor doing that hey we've got some SIP packages here, some staggered pin uh, SIP packages for the memory down here. Whoa, they ran out of space, I guess, on the board, so they had to go for those high density SIP packages. Probably need a ton of memory on this for doing uh, these sort of effects. So they've got those here and also down here as well. And other obscure name things, GDC, INF, whatever these things are, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Masking and cropping has its own section right up here and then there's color mixing right up the top. Curiously, we don't see much of in this thing is we've got a socket up here, dip socket, for this, what, CY? Is that like a Cypress part or something like that? Yeah, I checked, that's a uh, Cypress prom part. So there you go. So they've obviously got some sort of processing and or state machine installed in these things that require all these proms associated with them, but all these dedicated Sony chips, I, oh, goodness. And you Google these, like CXD8063, you get a bit of a lead. It's a matrix slash encoder chip. Eh, we got one! Yes, look at this, CXD8063 data sheet. Uh, found it, there it is. And, well, it's not much, but the system clock, serial interface clock, switch in chip select... Uh, yeah, P output limiter, blah, 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 blah. And, well... Here we go, we might have a bit of a block diagram. Look at that. There we go. Make heads or tails of that. Actually, that one's interesting to find a data sheet on because not only is it used twice up here in the color mixer, but look, all the wiper generator circuitry here, 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 uh, at least three times, four, five, six, seven, at least seven odd times in the uh, wiper generator circuitry. So there you go, pretty important chip. They've obviously rolled that for a specific purpose and well, they're using it to the hilt in this sucker. And now we're getting somewhere. Here's the 8063s, but we've also got 8060 CXD 8062s as well. And I found a data sheet for these suckers as well, which as always, I'll link in down below. Eh, at least we're getting somewhere. There you go, the CXD 8062. Uh, sort of like companion chip, I guess. Uh, absolute mode, carrier, it's doing some adding in there and oh, various other stuff, limit, whatever that is. And uh, it looks like these are all uh, serial controlled, by the way, pretty much. So interesting combination. So you can really go to town to figure out, okay, 15-bit digital in, two's complement mode. All right, then there's a system clock driving it all, an interface clock. So it's all sort of serial digital uh, processing, stuff like that. And we're certainly on a roll. The chip next to it, 
the CXD8059. Fantastic. We can get this one as well. Once again, not a huge amount of info, but at least we're getting uh, the pinout and the block diagram. And here we go. Is a, We've got ourselves waveform generators, serial interface and control. And yeah, it looks like we've got a mixer and modulation adder, multi-gain, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff happening in that one. So you combine all these custom chips together. These are obviously not designed for, you know, generic uh, purposes. Well, maybe they might be using multiple uh, products and things like that. But yeah, pretty much designed for a specific task, engineered to go into the complete system and build up the whole thing. And this is the point at which you ditch Google, because once you find one like this, likely, in this case, Datasheet for you, they have the archive, they've scanned in or, you know, found uh, all these Sony data sheets for this particular product. So you find one in here and I just go now and type in the number into here, data sheet for you, and ah, they're turned up all over the place. Here we go, I just typed in the huge uh, chip on there, the big quad flat pack CXD8060, it's a CMOS polar uh, coordinate. And once again, we can get the data sheet for that sucker. Brilliant. Well, let's have a look inside this one. <laughs> there we go, it's a big chip. What is that, 120 pin quad flat pack? Oh, it's not that huge, but anyway, it's bigger than some of the others. And once again, we get all pinouts, you know, all usable uh, info, but look at this. Control, oh, it's got ROM, internal dividers, uh, stat latches, rounding, square roots, it's doing limiting, it's doing, um, it's squaring stuff, it's getting the absolute value of X and Y there, and it's doing all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, and doing that, that looks like parallel multiple times, uh, all the data in parallel, and as I said, all serial controlled, all master clock controlled, stuff like that so fantastic if you really wanted to figure out uh, how this stuff was doing it you could actually you know put together all these uh, system block diagrams and figure it all out and unfortunately we ran out of luck on the CXD8331 that we've got around here in the mass crop region ah well can't always win but that one, for example, well, they're, made, they're reusing them everywhere. So these are pretty generic parts, and they're going to system engineer the things so that they can design uh, generic parts. They want to reduce the number of ASICs which they have to do on this thing. So they've got it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times just on this one board. And next up is our combiner lighting board, and we actually get our first look at some analog stuff. We'll take a closer look at all this analog section up here, but two, four, six, eight different sections clearly got hybrids with some analog input stuff. So we'll take a look at those, and then just all the usual regular boring digital processing stuff. We've got ourselves internal video process, whatever that means. We've got ourselves... Uh, uh, the external video C process, boring video input, uh, you know, it's called video input, but look, it's two custom Sony uh, digital parts, so, you know, nothing to do with analog at all. But check this out, something that we haven't seen yet on any of the boards is a bodge. But look, we got ourselves a bodge wire, nicely tacked down here and here, going from this pin of this chip all the way out, down the hole and presumably down some, you know, via on the bottom of the board for easy access. So they goof that up. Very surprising at this sort of level, considering the amount of systems engineering that's gone in this to get it right and have so few bodges. Well, it's surprising to even see one at the end of the day. And here we go, we've got analog inputs, dead giveaway, look, shielding, ground uh, shielding between each of the individual traces. So these aren't differential pairs, these are single-ended, got to be video signals uh, coming over, analog signals into these uh, custom Sony hybrid chips, because, well, we'll take a look at the package in a minute, but dead giveaway, the trace comes over here and then goes into a big AC coupling cap like that, so dead giveaway that it's video. There you go, we've got some analogy stuff happening around here, just all passive uh, kind of stuff. We've got an inductor, we've got some large uh, caps, which are probably the coupling caps, as I said. We've got a few resistors, maybe some uh, termination in there or something like that happening. But anyway, these are custom uh, hybrid chips. So, yeah, let's see if we can actually uh, get a side on view of that. And there you go, it's some sort of pin grid array like that, and uh, yeah, it looks like some sort of ceramic hybrid with uh, that's been uh, capped 
on top. So that would be interesting. I don't want to actually uh, destroy one, but yeah, they've rolled their own custom hybrid. What is it? Some sort of, you know, video amplifier module or uh, something like that? I don't know. And no surprises for finding a 75 ohm resistor in there. Terminator. And we're just seeing more of the same. This is the shadow effects board. And once again, the IDT RISC uh, processor up here. Some of the huge Sony uh, custom ASICs. But we've got some, th some things like the frame memory. There we go. We can recognize that up here, up here. We've got memory addressing around here. Common? What does that mean? I got no idea. Uh, output processing. And we've got uh, some filter. Oh, look, a 3-volt regulator down here. Wow, geez, I thought all this was uh, just 5-volt over the whole system. But I wonder what they need the 3-volt. Uh, and is it 3 or is it 3.3? I don't know. Interesting. But there you go. And then you've got some processing more circuitry up here marked common. And then big 10 amps. They need a lot of grunt on this board. And this one is the 7060 key channel recursive effects board. And well, look at it, chock full. This is one of the uh, densest boards on here, really. And well, just all digital. Fantastic. What can you say? Uh, it's all Sony. This thing's got a ton of sections on here. We've got memory A, B, C, D down here. We've got... Uh, what is it? Uh, record control, I think it is. Uh, no, well, recursive YV fill, something like that. Recursive KV fill, YV fill. Uh, C, former, whatever that is. Y, oh no, Y frame, C frame, something like that. Recursive V. Ah, oh, goodness. Dust KV filter, I presume it's a filter over there and all sorts of weird and wonderful names gdc whatever that is uh input filter mix scan conversion all sorts of stuff happening here control uh, generic control filter v oh man more modules in poker crow probat now i was going to talk about pcb layout on something like this now with something like this system and these boards it's all yeah, you know, like uh, forget about the routing. It's all about the placement. So that's why you design and group the things into the individual modules, and you put them and you, of course, group them together. It's all about the placement. These individual sections may have been individually uh, routed outside and then moved in as sections, but generally you would place all this. And because it's all digital, it's all digital. Then you could actually auto route. Uh, something like this, but not like complete auto routing. You might auto route some sections or something like that. Like all this memory stuff over here, you might let it sort of route those after you've placed them and maybe done some uh, pre selective routing around here, trial routing to see that it actually does what you want. Then you'd copy it and let it rip on the whole lot or something like that. But this is a huge placement job, not necessarily a huge routing job. So you'd spend probably 90% of your time placing and figuring out where everything goes on this board rather than actually routing. Now I'm on to the next board here which actually doesn't have a number so I'm not entirely uh, sure about what this one is. It's one of the uh, you know effects boards obviously something like that but check out the routing on here. I mean you know it looks like it hasn't been auto routed you know it looks fairly clean fairly tight all laid out in rows very consistent it looks like this has been done by a human so i don't think there's a huge amount of auto routing that's actually happened on here i could be wrong they could be using a really schmick uh auto router but as i said in professional layout tasks like this i've laid out boards almost uh, this big with this many uh, number of chips pretty close to it and it's not about with an auto router you would not just place all the chips and then press the auto route button it does everything for you as i said you would selectively you know i want to route just this memory section here please i don't want to waste time dicking around with this you know just let it rip so you would place them like this and you'd say i you'd highlight those and just let those rip and sort of integrate all those in something like that and of course when you got when you want to lay out and uh route 
all these sort of stuff. Well, in complete modules like this, look at this. Too easy, right? You just do one and then you can duplicate the route for each particular layer and depending depending on the tool that your software uh, CAD tool that you're actually using whether or not that's easy or hard to duplicate your routing and get your netlist right and everything else well that's another subject entirely and is very uh, tool specific but generally once you've got that it's pretty easy to duplicate your routes up like that so something like this board might look hideously complex and it is I mean there's you know somebody laying out this board would have probably spent Oh, I don't know. That's that's a good couple of weeks job to lay out that board and get it all right. That's after everyone's done the schematic and integrated, you know, made sure all the parts are there, everything else, just to sort of play, figure out where to place everything, do your trials, shuffle stuff around, all things like that. Because as you can see, it's pretty dense. There's not much room left on this board and you would have been tasked with some poor bastard tasked with laying out this board okay it's got to fit on this board and well probably they're gonna say well we need it all single-sided because we want access and that's a professional way to do it for you know uh, servicing and all sorts of access issues and things like that so we don't want double-sided load for example yeah go ahead and put all the passives on the bottom but as a general rule it looks like in this whole system somebody has determined well we don't want chips on the bottom we only want passives on the bottom thank you very much so you haven't got much physical room left over so you know you might start of course you might go okay and by you know start by placing a block like this and selectively routing it make and tightening up the layout so you'd work on on just one of these blocks and you go okay and you get it down to that size because you might start by having the chips spread out a bit but then you might find well once you've filled it up it takes this much of the, you know, half and two thirds of the board instead of half the board. And you go, well, I can't afford that real estate because I can't fit everything else. So you might have to spend a lot of time, you know, a day just dicking around with one of those sections to get it as tight as possible, shuffling around the placement, which way you rotate the chips to try and get the tightest route possible in that section. So once you've optimized that layout around there and it's as tight as you could possibly get it and you're so super proud of it woohoo look what I did you shout out from your cubicle yes I got it you know progress and well you've only just done that little bit but that's a huge key factor to then get in or to saving up all the space for all this other stuff which is is more spread out so really you know a lot of work goes into the early uh, sections of this and then once you got okay well I've got half my board dedicated to all these duplicated channels okay I've just got enough room left for these and you place that and then well what happens if you place all these and then you go well I needed an extra inch or half an inch on the board ah oh, you're screwed but these things generally come together in the end and you usually don't end up with that because while you're laying out stuff and placing all these parts you're conscious of how you got it in your head of how much general area you've got available and things like that so you might start off with a floor plan uh, layout where you just go through and you don't worry about route you just get it to throw down the chips you might group them into you know sections and just see that it's all going to fit on the board and well if it doesn't you might have to plead your case for a double-sided loaded board for example but in this case hey they got away with it lots of stuff very high dense you might have to go to another you might have said well okay we're going to shoot for a six layer board but you might have gone eh, sorry we need eight layers or something like that to get the routing density required I don't know this one's probably a six layer board you're not going to get this on a uh, four layer board of course because well you're going to have a ground plane and a power plane in there over the whole thing as I said this thing almost entirely five volts I don't see any other power on there uh, we've got the one little power circuitry down the bottom and power input uh, filtering and fusing uh, down here and then when you're relying on just one big five volt digital plane and that's where a job like this is really quite nice when you've got that plane over the whole thing you don't have to worry about splitting planes and routing layers like you do in modern boards for example you've got a modern FPGA it needs five different freaking power supplies and you've got to route the things all over the board and it's a nightmare these days. I love the days when you just had a single ground plane. Everything was just 5 volts or, or you did all 3.3 or something like that. It was just much easier. Today's ones, 
real pain in the ass with all the multiple layers, uh, multiple uh, ones, local regulation, all sorts of things. Oh, it's really ugly. It's really quite nice and therapeutic to lay out a big 5 volt only board like this. And just to prove there's nothing up my sleeve, look, this dense board, ta-da, bugger all on the bottom, just your bypassing, look at that. So that is a beautiful job to physically fit all of the parts on that board and get that routed in, what, you know, six layers or whatever it is. Fantastic job. And last but certainly not least, we have finally so a little bit more uh, interest. Once again, this is the uh, 7020 board. This is the switchable I.O. board. So this stuff is the one that does the 422 uh, processing and all that sort of jazz. A couple of daughter boards on here. This one plugged into there. We've got another one that plugs into here. But And we've got a bit of coax running down there. Look at that, that isn't a bodge, that's actually purpose design. They've run that coax, they need to get it from there over to there. Oh, I can't take it all the way on there in a different layer, screw that. Don't want to dedicate a whole another couple of layers to the board just to route that over. We'll use a bit of coax, thank you very much. And this board is pretty rare in that, it, look, it does have localised power around here for something. So obviously one specific thing required its own power supply and that's what they've done here. But apart from that, Everything's powered from the one one rail, the one power plane. And we've got ourselves a reference SIG here. So reference signal generator, I guess, generating a reference video signal perhaps. And something you may have picked up on all of these boards is that they have a dip arrow. And I've explained this on previous videos. This means the board travels that way. Da -da -da -da. Pigs in space. Travels that way through the uh, dip uh, reflow uh, solder bar. So it's got the wave soldering uh, process and that does any through hole parts like these uh, ceramic hybrids up here. They would all be wave soldered from the bottom. And check this out. This board has two bodges on it. This is the first one. Look, they couldn't get that surface mount cap there. So they've put in a separate one like that and they've gunked it down. Radial cap in there. Why have they done that? I don't know. Even worse, oops, <laughs> looks like they've probably got some sort of pull-up mod here. They've got just a leaded resistor there on this um, Altera CPLD here. So, yeah, likely something was giving them probably a, you know, they might have left a pin floating or something like that, giving them a pain in the ass, and they had to pull it up, perhaps. That would be my guess. And given that this is the main I.O. board, of course, you'd expect this to be where the DACs and ADCs are. There's high quality 10-bit DACs and ADCs to uh, sample uh, the video signal and to output it, reconvert it from the digital back into the analog. But I can't find any sort of, you know, analog devices part or anything like that. All custom Sony part numbered. Pain in the ass. So, yeah... Sorry, I can't really show you anything unless I go through and Google every single part number again. You can do that to your heart's content because the high-res photos are up on the website eevblog.com. So you can just check them out and, well, you can try and find them yourself. If you do, hey, link them in. I'm going to crowdsource it. We've got something a little bit out of the usual here. We've got ourselves little uh, crystal oscillator modules here. Couldn't find any info on that uh, CDX1312 chip there, unfortunately. So that... Section D1, D2 signal generator. So, so yeah, some sort of reference uh, signal generator, something like that. I don't know, to sort of get the system in the mood for <laughs> doing things, so to speak. I don't know. You'd have to look at the overall block diagram of the entire board. Shame we don't have those, though, because that would explain a lot. Weird little sections like this single chip one. FV, Cont, what is that? EFF, I don't know. Um, freeze? Memory? I don't think it's phrase, uh, frame memory because, well, where does the Z come from? I don't know. Bizarre. Once again, yeah, you need more detailed info on all this sort of stuff. And this board, eh, who knows what that does. That's a rare double-sided load, actually. Look at that. And a tiny little 3-volt generator. Oh, it's lonesome. Once again, is it actually 3 volts or is it 3.3? Eh. So there you have it. That is the last of the boards. And, well, <laughs> I got a bit monotonous in the end there. Unbelievable. I don't know what that second missing board was. Doesn't matter, but the amount of systems engineering that goes into that, how many, how many design hours, how many designer hours went into that is just absolutely ridiculous.
ridiculous. But that's the kind of complexity you get with this pro-level gear that you never see, you never hear of. And you know, there's probably hundreds of people working on, on a product like this. Unbelievable, you know, from go to woe, not to, and that's just the hardware side of things, let alone all the software and the firmware on each individual board and other stuff and the user interface and the all the effects and everything else to work out the algorithms for all the stuff. And oh man, unbelievable. And power supply time, look at this. They've even put a little finger hold on that and that just slides out, oh. Look at that. No, I was wrong about the big uh, toroid. Completely and utterly wrong. Wow. Look at that. That's a beast. Enormous. Nice big common mode line filter on the input. Great start. Look at that. That thing would have cost a fortune in its, on its own. Made in Japan, of course. And there's the big ass connector going over to the back plane that's powering all of these boards so that'd be carrying you know like 50 amps total or something like that 50 60 amps easy total and clearly what we have here is a big ass switch mode uh, converter with individual switch mode blocks like this main basically we've got the mains input over here from the filter we've got some extra looks like a, a common mode uh, filter here we've got some input protection with some mods i think no, no, that's actually some more uh, filtering. And then we've got the main filter cap. So basically, uh, where was the... Yeah, that's that's obviously not the bridge rectifier. No, haven't found the bridge rectifier yet. So I don't know. Maybe, ah, maybe it's this. This is our input bridge. This is probably our input bridge rectifier here. This is our main uh, 450 volt, 7, 470 microfarad uh, filter cap, so converting mains input, rectifying it, converting it directly to DC. Nice angling there on the, nice artistic angling on the fuses there. I rather like that. Neat. And uh, then from the high voltage DC, we just got, uh, these are just DC to DC converter bricks. Whether they're off the shelf or whether or not they're actually uh, designed and uh, built by Sony, I don't know. We might have to uh, take the, take some screws out there and have a look. Aha, uh -huh, look at it. Lambda modules, there you go. They're pretty much the Rolls Royce of DC to DC converter modules. They don't come much better than Lambda. So there you go. That one I thought might have been the bridge rectifier at first glance. Um, no, it's got a uh, V in, V out control. So yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. And no surprises for guessing, we're not going to see anything in these modules unless we desoldered them, cracked apart. They're probably even potted uh, inside, perhaps. All we get is a big seal pad on there if we take the heatsink off. These things are uh, dip package, through hole package, soldered directly down to the board. Bummer. I'm not going to destroy the power supply just to have a look inside a, a Lambda DC to DC converter. Sorry. Well, that is totally not what I thought. I thought that would be a one big DC to DC uh, converter, in which case you'd expect the mains input. You'd have a big ass rectifier here, some big ass filtering caps like we get here. And well, you know, these are just DC to DC converter bricks, but I cannot for the life of me find any sort of uh, bridge rectifier in this thing. It's certainly you know, not the, I can't even find any rectifier, let alone one big enough for the power we're talking about here, so I don't know, it's rather perplexing. The only thing uh, left to consider is that these are actually not DC to DC converters, they're uh, AC to DC uh, bricks and uh, converting directly on the mains and uh, each output, they're probably, they like these three might be identical or 5 volts or something like that and they're just separating them out uh, for example, and driving different pins on the connector over here with each one perhaps, but why they've uh, got um, the big ass 450 volt, uh, 470 microfarad cap here and here, I don't know. Aha, uh -huh, there we go, I found it on one of the big bricks here. There you go, output 360 volts DC, 1.4 amps, and it looks like an additional one at uh, 2.1 amps as well. There you go, that's why we've got two big ass filter caps on this thing. Looks like we've got two different outputs, and uh, that's our uh, 240 volt AC to high voltage DC converter, and then once again, so that's that one over there. And then once again, as I said, these are probably then uh, high voltage DC to low voltage DC to converter bricks there for various things. And going over to the power supply. So that is a brilliant power supply. Very nice indeed. Yeah, I was way off the mark with the uh, toroid 
uh, thing. Clearly, you know, it wasn't going to be big enough to power uh, power this beast, that's for sure. They really needed to do a switch mode converter here to get the efficiency. And they've done it really well. I mean, these are Lambda. Oh, oh. Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. Nerds. Look at these lovely little straps. Look at that attention to detail to hold down that wire. They've got another one over there as well. You can see that little hook in there. Beautiful. Look, it's even, they've even heat shrunk that over that tab with the, and it mounted on the board. Ah, oh, brings a tear to the eye. Now I have taken the lid off here, but unfortunately it's probably going to be a bit of work to get into the back panel board, which is mounted down in here and also the back connector board. And I, I, sorry, but I don't think it's worth the effort to strip this thing down. I've already spent enough hours on this bloody teardown already. And uh, yeah, we're not gonna see anything hugely interesting. There's one big black back plane board there connecting everything together. I'm not, as I said, I'm not sure if they're all parallel connected and you can just put the boards in any order willy nilly or whether or not. I think they are in specific things because that's what the manual uh, tells you there is a specific order the boards go in and uh, because well some are uh, wired presumably some would be specifically wired through to the outputs like this so that'd be part of the uh, system because you don't want to waste a lot of the pins that you have to dedicate to all these output jacks you want all those to sort of go down to one board on the one or two boards on your back plane you don't have to waste the pins on your back plane connector in here because you need those for all the digital board to board interconnects and all that sort of stuff so yeah that's probably that's i uh, wager decent money on that that that's actually the uh case how these things are wired together because i i used to work on uh video uh, switching gear, that was my first job, uh, and slow scan video uh, conversion and video and security switching systems, very uh, similar to this with, you know, massive backplanes and massive number of uh, BNCs and stuff like that, and that's pretty much how they were configured, though, though it went through to specific boards on the backplane. I'm not sure if you can see in there, but there is another board that the BNCs mount on, and there's another board to board in and connect uh, down the bottom here, which just joins the two boards together. So nothing very exciting. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that look at this professional level Sony video digital effects processor, mid 90s vintage. And this is how they used to do all your uh, video effects that you see on TV and commercial video and stuff like that. And really, I don't know, do they do it all on PCs these days? I'm not entirely sure. Hard to beat dedicated hardware like this, even if you are doing it uh, or they are doing it on a PC these days, they would still have those video control panels uh, like we saw earlier. To, you know, the user interface would be totally optimized. Someone's not going to sit there with a mouse and dick around trying to do stuff. No, you need the jog shuttle controls, you need the big buttons that light up dedicated to switching things and stuff like that. So that's when you, if you see those photos inside uh, professional TV studios or OB vans or something like that, you'll still see all this custom gear designed specifically for it. And as I said, this is only an SD version uh, of uh, four component video. It's, it doesn't even do HD version. I'm sure Sony do have uh, HD versions of these video processors these days. I haven't looked, but uh, there you go. I'm sure they do. I might have a look. And if I can, I'll link them in. But there you go. Fantastic amount of systems engineering that goes into this. I love it. Oh, it's just beautiful. How many hours they spend on this? And there's hardly any bodges in this thing at all. It is just beautiful. Thing of beauty and a joy forever. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. Links are down below. That is the place to do it. And as always, I've got uh, some high res uh, photos of this and all the boards available on eevblog.com. That'll be linked down below as well. You can check that out. Unfortunately, I had my camera set to 8 megapixels instead of uh, 16 megapixels, unfortunately. So they're half the resolution they should have been, but they're still pretty good anyway. If you want to look at the specific details and also the data sheets, uh, as many as I can find, it will be linked in as well. There you go. That's it. Oh, goodness. Sony, 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 Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. Nerds. Catch you next time.